Welcome to Marxism Today. I'm Tony Schmidt. And I am Red Wagner. Today, I wanted to start out with something I had heard mentioned on a podcast. I think, uh, Red, you said that you, I think, had heard this on, about this on NPR, and uh, it's Amazon's Mechanical Turk service. Mm, yes. So, what it is, is it's a, it's a little website. I think it's mturk dot com, but I don't know, just Google search Amazon Mechanical Turk and you'll find it. And you put up on their jobs that you want done essentially, little like internet y jobs you want done, it seems to be, and then people give uh a price they're willing to pay in a time frame. And you know, that doesn't necessarily sound too bad in and of itself. Um but it so some people, just to, so I understand this, some people post tasks. Yeah. Like, mm, look at, like, sort all of these photos or something. I don't know if that's one of the tasks, but. They're random things like that, yeah. Like, the only one that's popping into my head was, like, they wanted every country listed in, like, German and in French and. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. But just, like, little office tasks that anyone could do sort of thing. Yeah. And. One person posts it with just a flat rate for doing the task. There's no, it's not like an empl- it's not like a job where you are in, hired by the person and you have like official income and, well, I don't know, benefits. There's obviously no benefits. It's just like, whatever, 20 bucks for this task. Yeah, except 20 bucks is generous. Most of them, and I think it's interesting, it's limited by the country you're in. When I was looking at this the other day, they said they had, you know, over, like, I don't know, a million different tasks to do. I could only find about 4,000. Cause they must, so I think they limit it to the country you're in. So. Like, you mean because we're in the US, we don't see the very cheapest tasks because it would be insulting. Or the vast majority of them, yeah. Okay, yeah, because, because if you worked it out and you were getting paid half a cent an hour, like, that would make a news story, and Amazon would look bad because of it. Yeah, and that's exactly what happens, is you get these companies that will basically farm this work out to a bunch of workers, and a lot of these jobs pay a penny. Like, the amount that was over a dollar was, I think, less than half when I was searching on it the other day. Wow. And that's for the ones in America. The ones that paid a lot were, like, extraordinarily, they wanted a lot like, uh, the most expensive one, I think, was $75. But for that, you had to maintain a diary about either your diet or something like that. And you had to have, like, five entries a day for, like, six weeks or something like that. And the other thing about them is, and I didn't look into it more, but it, it after you complete the task, you post whatever the thing is, and then it has to get approved before you get payment. So that does leave the door open to somebody posting them, saying, oh, I don't approve that, taking the actual work and not paying you for it. Uh, yeah, like, it's just, the door is wide open for wage theft. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if there's a mechanism to, like, complain about that. I'd assume there might be. Yeah, but I could see it being difficult to follow up. Like, if you're a person who's taking these tasks, I bet you don't have a lot of extra money laying around for legal fees should you need to pursue this. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a little confused as to why they chose the name Mechanical Turk. Because the Mechanical Turk was a... Uh, it was a robot that wasn't actually a robot. Right, right, it was a fake robot that would play chess and they had it dressed up like a Turkish person. Or a stereotypical Turkish person. I think this was 1900s, I think what it was. They really just had somebody underneath it playing chess like it would... Like, I don't remember, it would light up or if it'd point to where it wanted things moved. And whoever the person was crammed under this thing was actually pretty good at playing chess. Mm. But, so, I'm like, I don't know. 
You know, maybe it's a very appropriate name, because it's saying, look, all this happens by magic, but really there's just somebody uh, getting screwed over under all of this, you know? Yeah, it's that for the job poster, it appears to just be a, a computer program that does it, but actually it's real people that do it. Yeah. Which is a super interesting, like, sci-fi, like, plot theme already. Yeah. You know, like, that's kind of Matrix-y, and I, I think there's a bunch of stuff that plays into that idea. As a sci-fi theme, I think it resonates with us in the first world, because so much of what we see is fetishized commodities. Commodities that are just there on the shelf, and the truth of the matter is that the, many of them were made in sweatshops. Yeah. Yeah. So really, is that, yeah, when you frame it like that, is the Mechanical Turk website, is that actually worse then? Or is it just more of the same? <laughs> I guess it's more direct. I mean, I th I think there's a lot of things going on in it. I couldn't say that it would be better or worse, because it kind of depend. like, the prices for Mechanical Turk can vary so much. Yeah. Seems like... I wouldn't venture the guess that the pay per hour for Mechanical Turk in most countries is lower than like any sort of standard skilled or non skilled labor in that country. Yeah. Well like it clearly is here in the US, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same in other countries as well. Yeah, well like the one cent tasks I was looking at these and like these aren't something that like you can do in an instant. Like there's something that would take a couple minutes to do, at least. Yeah. I feel like if you turned off your computer, you might save one cent worth of electricity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Instead of doing that task. Here's a one cent one. So you have ten minutes to type some text that they don't actually show in this. You have ten minutes to, to type some text that I assume is in a picture. For one penny. Oh. And then you, like, they must have, like, one page for each, like, a yeah. penny per page sort of thing. And you can yeah. just take task after task. Yeah. Keep doing that. Yeah. So, I don't know how much that is to type, but if it's, like, typing up a page or even a paragraph for one penny, I mean, say that takes you, I don't know... 10 seconds to do instead of their 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's 6 cents a minute. What does that work out to in an hour? That doesn't work out to very good in an hour. 6 times 6 is $3.60 an hour. Yeah. If you can keep up that pace. If the 10 minute ta if the 10 minute maximum task you can do in what did we say 10 seconds? 10 seconds, seconds yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You still make less, slightly less than half of uh, the minimum wage. Yeah. So it looks like what's happening is you're experiencing hyper exploitation, but probably the reason that people do it is for flexibility. That's just a very odd thing. Another reason why Amazon is um, monstrous. Oh, yeah, because we have a whole Amazon episode. Yeah, yeah. It's another good example of how Amazon is working to ruin the world. One other thing I want to say about this. I don't know if the name is technically racist. It sounds really racist. Yeah, it, my guess is their defense is, oh, well, we're naming it after this historic thing, which was racist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of the exotic. I mean, it wasn't like a wasn't like a negative racism thing about the, you know, a magical Turk mm -hmm. doing that, but it's the exotification. Exotification? Is that how you would say that? Yeah, it'd yeah. be treating that part of the world as if it were strange and exotic and magical. Yeah. yeah. Which in its own way is a kind of benign racism. Yeah, yeah. Even even positive racism is not good. Yeah, I think I would say it's it's racist, but nothing that anybody's going to call them on. Yeah. Because it's not blatant enough for somebody to be really offended by. Yeah. It's just enough for me to think, I don't know why, but I think that's probably racist. Yeah. But then again, you can have somebody like, uh, what's the comedian, Jeff Dunham, 
I don't know if you're familiar with that comedian. He's the puppet guy, right? Yeah, the very racist puppet guy. Yeah. Which I never see anybody call him out on how incredibly racist that stuff is. Yeah, apparently if it's a puppet, you can get away with some crazy racism. Yeah, it's... Oh, man, am I... Because doesn't he have, like, a lazy jalapeno pepper? Yep, a lazy jalapeno pepper. A a dead turban-wearing terrorist. Oh, man. Well, that's what made me think of it, because the Mechanical Turk had a turban on. Yep. Yeah, that's... Wow. Yeah. So, I don't remember what else, but he's got, yeah, pretty racist puppets. Wow. And the joke of them isn't that, you know, anything else. It is just that. Yeah, he's not like... Like, Dave Chappelle did it really well, where you can have comedy about race that critiques the the divisions and and racism within interactions however i think i mean i think he quit doing that because of how people interpreted his work yeah how people will react to like the n-word being used on things they'll say well see it's said in this song or by that person therefore it's okay to use and it's you know it's the Missing the point. Yeah, it was like, well, everyone likes when Dave Chappelle says this, so now I can say it, because he was critiquing. And you might think you're critiquing, but... I don't know how many of those people thought they were critiquing. Yeah, probably not. Very many. They they found it funny, but they didn't understand the reason for the humor in it, which is the abhorrent truth in the sad state of race in this country. Yeah. I mean, it's a problem with the creation of any art form is that no matter what your intents are as the author, they can become changed and manipulated once you give it to an audience. And that's, I think, the worst kind of way that happens to Dave Chappelle. Yeah, or like, to compare him to Nietzsche, apparently. Like Nietzsche, or, yeah, it's pronounced Nietzsche, right? I don't know, I hear people say Nietzsche, or (laughs) Nietzsche. Whatever. I'll just I say think, Nietzsche. I think it's fine either way. We all know who you're talking <laughs> yeah. about. The guy with the big mustache. Yeah. The big mustache. <laughs> you know, like his work, because his brother was a, a fascist, or brother-in-law was a fascist, so his work was changed and made to be an ideological backing for fascism. Mm-hmm. Even though, I mean, I definitely don't agree with Nietzsche on everything, but don't think he was a fascist. <laughs> I I haven't ever really read him, so I I can't take a stance on it. I do know, yeah, that there are a lot of people out there, including Marxists, who view him as a proto-fascist or like. Yeah, and there were some there are some things that you could see as proto-fascist, but like his concept of the Ubermensch, and I think it's interesting because um, I just listening to. A recording of an essay by Emma Goldman, where she defends Nietzsche's uh, Ubermensch concept. Mm. And that's interesting, too, because that's before it's been appropriated by the fascists, because that's, I think, about 1910 is when that was from, or possibly earlier. Yeah, I could definitely see, like, depending on what you mean by Ubermensch, which, is, for our listeners that haven't heard of Nietzsche or Nietzsche, Ubermensch, it's just German for Superman, basically, and it's, like, supposed to be, well, maybe you should explain it, but it's supposed to be, in my understanding, someone who, like, like a new level of mankind. Yeah. Like, as someone who's above and beyond what man means and is now. Right, which the fascists took as uh, Aryan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they use that as a backing for their races and the superiority of the German race. Emma Goldman was defending it, if I'm remembering correctly, saying that the Ubermensch would basically come about once society had stripped itself of all of its capitalist fetters and man was allowed to truly flourish uh, without the state repressing them or other laws. Yeah. And then you would have the rise of everyone would be an ubermensch because you were no longer repressed and you'd be free to do that. Now, that's probably her throwing a lot of her own views into the reading of it. And I've not read his piece uh, where he discusses it, but... This would make a great topic sometime. It would. We, We should write this one down. We should. So anyway, I don't know how we got to that. 
So for work, and I've also read a lot about it because I'm kind of I'm maybe I should introduce the topic. Uh, space economics, like outer space, space, not like geographical space, outer space uh, economics. I'm kind of a big space nerd. Like, if I could do the math, I probably would have wanted to do, like, theoretical physics or something like that. Something that dealt with all the fun space stuff, because I find that stuff endlessly interesting. But alas, I can't, so I don't. So I I like reading about space stuff. And one interesting thing is uh, space exploration, obviously. There's a lot of hype about NASA wants to actually send people to Mars, which is pretty sweet i think yeah because that's a lot farther than the moon right? oh yeah yeah the moon is it's like a two-day trip i think whereas mars i think they've figured out a way to get it down to about uh, three months oh using uh ion engines which are charged particles that they shoot out they don't provide a lot of thrust but they provide a constant thrust so you have an exponentially increasing thrust. So if you're going a long distance, it, it yeah. makes a difference. Because there's not a lot of friction in space. Right. There's bas- there's basically no friction in space. So, yeah, it's nothing you'd be able to – well, I guess you can use it and whatever. It's it's a good thing for getting around far distances in space. And the traditional rocket boosters would take, I think, about six months to get there. Anyway, along with this greater interest in space by NASA is – private corporations having a greater interest. Google right now is sponsoring a Lunar X Prize. Teams have until, I think it's the end of next year, to put a craft on the moon uh, and make it move, I believe it's 500 meters. It can, you know, cr- drive on the ground or it can fly over. It has to, if it flies, it has to land and then move, or it can drive or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it has to move the 500 meters or 1,000 or whatever it is and send back high quality digital photos and video and from the moon. So this is like a contest that yes. Google is doing? Yeah. Amongst Google employees or anyone? Anyone. A lot of these people who are doing there's I think thirty or forty different groups competing, and groups is actually a, a poor term. It should be corporations because part of the stipulation of this it can has to be ninety percent of it uh, at a minimum has to be privately funded. There's a very little room for actual government funding because their whole thing is showing how private corporations can do it better and cheaper than the government did there's talk uh, the thing goes on about how you know governments you know the USSR and uh, the United States spent billions of dollars getting people into outer space and the moon and they're going to do it all for less than I think the grand prize is 30 million dollars so basically if you want to try and actually do this you have to do it for less than 30 million dollars or you could just do it at a loss for the prestige or whatever. Right. Um, so, and it's of course ignoring the fact that any of these corp, any of these things can do it for cheaper than that because of the billions of dollars that the government spent on yeah. developing the technology to get, if you had, if yeah. they had to develop all of that in, from scratch, they'd never be able to do it for that cheap or do it at all. Not to mention that was in the sixties. Yeah. And it's not the 60s anymore, and the cost of different technologies, surprise, surprise, has changed. Yeah. No, no, that's not it. It is that private companies do things more efficiently than public things. What I like about this is they're going to use this as proof of that statement. Yep. And they will point to their contest and say, look, a private entity won. But they have ruled out the possibility of a public entity even entering the contest. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think that's terribly interesting. And so, I was looking at uh, one of, just one example of how one of these companies is trying to fund this. Otherwise, you can send, I think it's a it depends on where you want to. So they will put stuff into space for you, either 
uh, on, on an orbit path towards the moon, in orbit around the moon, or on the actual lunar surface for you. Brand promotion is literally one of their things. Mm -hmm. So, Nike symbol on the moon. Yep. Um, they'll do like little satellites and stuff. So, if you have a satellite or your own little thing you want to get to the moon, actually, that would be the most amusing. Have just a teeny little crappy uh, car there that you pay them to bring up, and then you beat them to their uh, to the whatever five hundred meters, <laughs> and you, uh... <laughs> you you beat them out and win the prize. That'd be funny. Um, so, you know, if you have a satellite you want delivered into lunar orbit or some sort of sensor put on the moon, you can do that. They're also doing space mail, or I think they're calling it lunar mail, where you can send a letter, a picture, a keepsake, and they will drop it on the moon. Like a time capsule. Yeah, except on the moon. So, yeah. So that's some of the ways they're trying to find it. It's actually less expensive than I think. Like, to do like a one kilogram thing into like space or lunar orbit it's only like three hundred thousand dollars which is a phenomenal amount of money but actually that's you know for putting something on the moon yeah that's that's not too bad at all yeah like you wouldn't even need to be the richest person in the state that you live to to do that yeah you wouldn't have to be john menard yeah. from Wisconsin. Is he the richest? He's the I saw there was a there was actually an entertaining Facebook post. It was the richest person in the, in each state. Many of them have recognizable names. Hmm. So John Menard. Okay. Yeah, my girlfriend lives in or was is from Michigan. She lives here now. So I asked her who she thought. I, was gonna say, I just saw her. <laughs> yes. I asked her who she thought the richest person in Michigan was, and I gave her the hint that she re will recognize the last name. It's a Ford, isn't it? No, it's not. Really? Actually, it's not any car company person. Hmm. Unless 20 person, years ago, it would have been different. Yeah. Unless this person is involved in cars, but I don't know. The chain and the person's last name are both called Meyer, with, with a J. And it's like... The big box department store in Michigan. It's oh. very similar to a Walmart. Okay. Interesting. I've never heard of it. Yeah. I've been them. to a couple of Myers. Hmm. Like when I forget something on vacation when we're going to Michigan for Jen. <laughs> so yeah, anybody could put something in space. Um, and so these are just sort of smaller companies that are trying to do this. There are other companies that are trying to get to the moon. Uh, one is called, I forgot what it's called. It's got Lunar in the name. Anyway, so there are a couple companies that want to go to the moon to mine and find resources. Um, one from the moon itself and two from all the asteroids that hit the moon and deposit a lot of rare earth elements on there. Like, I think the moon is just full of platinum. Wow. Yeah. From asteroids. What What's the idea here, that they would have, like, mining robots? Yeah, mining robots, uh, or... I, so this is, they're not a hundred... They haven't ironed out all the details yet. A lot of these companies are still just in their figuring it out phase. Okay. But yeah, so basically, I think their first phase is to, like, find places, assess where the greatest mineral density and stuff is. And then, yeah, send up, like, mining robots to collect it. The funny thing for me is that I still have, like, the 1900s version of mining in my head. Maybe that's, maybe it's even older than that. But, like, if you imagine a miner, that's the last thing you'd imagine in space. Yeah. But, yeah, like you said, if there's a bunch of valuable minerals and, and metals and things like that up there. Yeah, and there are two companies... I think one is Deep Space Industries, and the other is something with an S. Damn. Boy, I'm bad at names right now. Anyway, there are a couple companies that are, one or two companies, I should say. There are two companies, exactly two, that are trying to uh, want to mine asteroids, grab my asteroids and mine them. That one is mind-blowing to me. Yeah. I can imagine within the realm of possibility that someone could send a ship to the moon, 
have a bunch of remote control bots leave it and and you know gather materials getting them back i would imagine being hard but it still seems possible to me mining an asteroid sounds like science fiction to me oh it is at the moment but i mean nasa is planning a mission to go to an asteroid and pick a boulder up from it and bring it back to orbit around the moon sometime in the 2020s so that astronauts can go up into lunar orbit and go uh, gather samples from it. Wow. And how big of a boulder are we talking about? You know, I don't know the exact size. Sizable, like probably several meters. I don't know. It's They don't... Their plan is to have it go survey an asteroid and then determine which one would be the best for them to grab. Wow. Based upon what they can find. You know, it's it's not it is sci fi, but it's not so far out there. And one of uh these two companies is very, very ambitious in their goal, and that is they want to basically use like three D printer type stuff to make a brand new like space industry where like everything in space they want to take these asteroids get all the water out of them because there's a lot of water in there Uh and then get like the materials the metals and stuff out and use the metals and stuff to build spaceships and space colonies and stuff and the water you can drink water and water you can also turn into hydrogen and oxygen which you can breathe oxygen and Oxygen and hydrogen are happen to be wonderful fuel for space. Hmm. So now, they, when you when you mention that wa- you can drink water, yeah, that's even further out. Right? Like you, that makes it sounds like you're talking about putting people out yeah. in space. Yeah, but using asteroids is just yeah, like resources to like, put more people in space and facilitate space travel and space exploration. So in the far future, an asteroid could be like a road stop where you could fill up on new water and new energy and new air? Yep. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So where this all ties in uh, with economics is that, er, and law and socialism, is that the United Nations treaties defines space and celestial bodies as the common resource of all humankind. They never define what a celestial body is, but uh, you cannot go, nor can any country, even though we've planted flags in the moon, you can't own the moon. You can't own Mars. So you can't companies and private corporation or countries, I should say, and non-government organizations who fall under the jurisdiction of whatever country they're in, when it comes to them going in outer space, um, cannot own. You can't own part of the moon. So when they want to go up there and mine the moon, they can't say, "Oh, this is our mining site. You have to keep out." The law is ambiguous and purposefully so as to what happens to any things extracted from outer space, Mm -hmm. as well as some of the smaller things, like, you know, an asteroid that's maybe 20 meters in diameter that isn't necessarily a celestial body. Yeah. Um, Because when they were trying to sort out this... Because once the Russians launched Sputnik... There needed to be some new laws made because technically, for the laws then, Sputnik violated the law because it crossed the airspace of every country when it circled around the globe. Hmm. Or every country in its orbit, including the United States. So technically, the United States could have taken Sputnik as an invasion by the Russians. Huh. Uh, thankfully, they didn't, and we're all still alive. So they drafted a bunch of treaties to basically make sure that the United States and the Soviet Union couldn't one-up each other in space. That's why no one can claim these things, because the Soviet Union and the United States both didn't want the other one claiming the moon. You can't have military things in space. You can't be used, it has to be peaceful use. You can't have weapons of mass destruction in outer space, so you can't put a nuke in a satellite to launch. No Death Stars. Correct. 
no Death Stars, according to the UN. However, there was a push by a bunch of nations to make everything extracted as well from outer space the common property of all mankind. So if a company went and grabbed an asteroid, like the most expensive estimated one, I think uh, is like 27 quintillion dollars worth of materials in it, that company wouldn't be able to reap all of the benefit of it. They would have to divvy up the money they made from that equally amongst the world. Yeah, which would be amazing. An amazing exercise to figure out, one, how you would do that, <laughs> and two, they just wouldn't do it if they thought they had to. Right, yeah, exactly. But So it's a gray area there, and the United States... We do a lot of stuff in space, more than most other countries. So basically what our national laws say for things in outer space tend to be the de facto rule if there isn't an explicit treaty about it. Mm. So some of these companies uh, and other like government contractors who do a lot of space stuff like Lockheed Martin uh, – have been lobbying and there have been laws passed to try and make it so that these companies can do it. Because if you're a company in the U.S., you, in order to get into outer space, you have to go through U.S. government. The U.S. government is responsible basically for any of their citizens or corporations in space. So they fall under U.S. law. So if U.S. law says you can take these things and keep them, then if there's not an explicit treaty it might just default to the U.S. law. I mean, it's really ambiguous. So you can't... can't so if, if the U.S. were to allow you to take resources back and claim them as your own, the international law would say you can't claim the moon, but you can go up there and take as many moon rocks as you want. Right. Or, or as much platinum off of the moon as you want, and that platinum is yours. Yeah, so, yeah. Again, it doesn't exactly say that. And I think the way they've gotten around taking moon rocks is, you know, the U.S. has taken moon rocks and stuff. The way they get around that is that if you can use space for the betterment of mankind, which includes space exploration and knowledge and scientific stuff. Mm -hmm. So since NASA uses these space rocks for scientific research, well, it's yeah. not an issue. That Yeah, that makes sense to me, because to bring back a space rock to put in a museum or in a lab where people can study it, that's one thing. To bring back a bunch of materials so that you can sell them and make a lot of money off it is a completely different thing. Yeah. And to, um, with the way economics works, it's a little confusing as to how actually profitable that could be, uh, especially depending on how the law is on that, because... Say you have an asteroid that's solid platinum, or rubidium, or I can't think of any other rare earth elements at the moment. But, you know, a lot of these things that we use for computers and stuff that we just don't have a lot of on Earth. Mm -hmm. And that we mostly only have on Earth because of asteroids that have hit. Um, we have a very small supply here. But if you suddenly have a giant supply from an asteroid, that's going to tank the price of that commodity. Yeah, so to say the price of... Robidium. I don't even know what robidium is, but you mentioned it, so I'm going to go with it. To say the price of robidium is X, and then, oh, this asteroid has this much robidium, so I'll just take the amount of robidium, multiply it by the price per unit, and that's how much the asteroid is worth. Yeah, it can't possibly work out if what you're doing is increasing the supply of robidium on Earth by, whatever, a million fold or something like yeah. that. So that leaves the door open for monopoly exploitation of those types of elements, and instead of a drop in price, perhaps even an increase in price. Mm. So yeah, there are lots of weird things, and I'm sure these will get ironed out before this stuff actually becomes an issue, whether for better or worse, probably for worse, um, especially if they go off U.S. law. Because the, one of the companies just launched a telescope... I think they want to launch a series of them to look for a suitable asteroid to mine. Um, some of the other ones, like the moon ones, are working on getting probes up there to look at the minerals that exist. Like I said, NASA is working on 
sending up something to go grab a rock. Um, you know, the European Space Agency right now has a probe around a comet. Actually, NASA has a satellite in the asteroid belt that's... I don't remember if it just got done with Ceres or if it's almost two Ceres, which is the largest dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. It's the biggest thing in there. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a little, it's smaller than Pluto, but it's one of the reasons that Pluto isn't a planet anymore is because if Pluto counts as a planet, so does Ceres and a few other things in the asteroid belt because they're all about the same size. Hmm. So. Yeah, there's a lot of research and stuff going on there. So now, what you're just saying to summarize is that now that corporations have privatized almost everything on Earth, they're they're starting to look to the stars to privatize some stuff out there too. Yep. Yeah, and like Mars colonies, there's I yeah I mentioned Mars, just skipped over it. I guess we'll go back. Um, there's a company I want to say it's called Mars One that wants to establish a permanent Martian settlement in on Mars. And I think they've already even drawn up, like, a list of people who they want to do that. Like, they were taking volunteer names. I have to ask you this. Have you ever seen, or read, I should say read, have you ever read any of the Red Mars series? No, you've recommended to me. They're on my list of books to read, but I have not read them yet. They, I mean, it wasn't my favorite book to read, but it's really, this is the thing, is they, the concept of the series is that the planet Earth sends a bunch of people, I think it's actually government sponsored, but planet Earth sp- sends a bunch of people to Mars to create a colony, and they've got a bunch of terraforming equipment and stuff like that, but the people that are on the spaceship are all a little bit nuts. Because they're all people that would give up their life to go to Mars and possibly die on the way to start a brand new planet. And they create a brand new society. And it's like an opportunity for them to start from scratch on a planet that doesn't have a history. Much like what the Europeans did to North America after killing off most of the natural inhabitants. Or most of the inhabitants at that time. They had a largely open continent to create a brand new system with and i think that's one of the reasons why to this day the u.s is one of the most purely capitalist countries because we didn't really establish other systems here first like feudalism and things like that yeah all except for slavery of course and we do still have that history the only mars sci-fi i guess they're doom that's mars i don't think they're gonna open up a gate to hell on mars though red faction There's a series of games called Red Faction, uh, which you would probably like. Uh, The first one, you are a miner on Mars. Oh. And you're, it's it's the Ultron Corporation? I don't know. There's a corporation that basically, they're all basically more or less slaves or in, you know, sort of the old work indentured things and terrible Mm. working conditions and the guards, like, attack you know, people and beat them up arbitrarily and stuff. And you spark a rebellion and you overthrow them and defeat them. And yeah, in the second one, you're on Earth, which is kind of weird. Although that one also, I didn't like as much, but it was very like the the main bad guy in that one was totally, it was meant to parallel the Soviet Union. Like he's got like a big, bushy mustache and everything too dresses just like stalin Um, and his name was stolen no it's something (laughs) oh i have to to look this up now because it was something ridiculous and then the one that i'm on is red faction gorilla where you're back on mars and a miner and the earth defense forces are basically a then a tyrannical government oppressing the people and you're rising up against them like, and i think the one after that's about like you find martian aliens or something so not as related but hmm. you know there are those ones political uh, space dramas yeah and like the i will have to use it for uh the symbol the symbol for the game like here's the symbol for red faction too wow very 
very Maoist inspired. Yes. Um, it, for our listeners, it's a red fist holding a red AK-47 with like the like a starbursty. Yeah, yeah, starburst background. So pot. That's the name of the guy. <laughs> so pot. Um, like Pol Pot. Hey, you know, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I'm sure. I have one more thought about uh, the space stuff. So you can't, a country cannot declare, uh, like, land. It can't claim land and stuff in space or in Mars. However, it did to me seem ambiguous about the laws or the international treaties that I don't know that a colony of people couldn't declare their own nation on something. Oh. It seems like there was a gap there as well, but I'm not a lawyer by any stretch of the imagination, so I could be wrong. But it did seem like it opened up the door for people to declare their own autonomous country. I would be okay with that. Yeah, me too. As Well, maybe. I would be okay with that if it was actually the people. I would not be yep. okay with it if it was a corporation sending up a bunch of people who then went... Hey, we're our own nation. Oh, and guess what? We're the headquarters for this company now. And they're here. On the, and we don't charge taxes. And we give them free reign to mine everything here in pocket. You know. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, we're the board of governors. You know, it's <laughs> that I'm not okay with. Yeah. It would have to be. It'd be like the British East India Company almost, except no people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like if there were barely any people and it was just like robots mining there and not... Yeah, and then they sold everything on on the Earth. Yeah, that yeah. would be different. Yeah. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA, and the views expressed in this podcast are ours. You can find us on Twitter at RedWagner2, that's the number two, and Schmidt AJ, S C H M I T T A J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog marxismtoday.wordpress.com You can also share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday all one word. You can also find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page facebook.com slash dsamadison Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>